All right, as some of you have known, I've done a bit of traveling. Um, I have spent some time in Africa, that's actually where I was born. Um, I also have spent time recently in Eastern Europe. Um, some of you have heard me talk about the place Transnistria. And um, for many of you who have also done traveling like this, you know that when you go to a new place, it's very different than your own. Um, there's different realities, there's different normals. For some people living in other places around the world, they don't see a car every day. But every single one of you come to school in a vehicle, you know? Uh, well, maybe, maybe a few of you walk. But you see cars, and cars are everywhere. Now, someone else in another part of the world, they can't even imagine a New York City traffic jam. They, it's not even in their conscience and, and nothing that's normal to them. So you see, all of us live in a place that, where we have a certain reality. Philmont, for you, is reality. Philadelphia is reality. Each of us have normals. For some of the kids um, living in Transnistria, they have different normals. Many of them don't even know what a normal family looks like. In fact, when we were visiting one of the orphanages, one of the girls said to my friend Anna in a discussion, she flat out does not believe that there is such a thing as a functional family. Families, functional, they don't fit in the same sentence. There's no such thing. Okay, so she has a certain lens, right, with which she sees the, the world and her reality about a, a family that is functional, parents that love you, is not a part of her reality. So I wanna give you that as my backdrop. In the last four months, God has been somewhat changing my reality, okay? So things that I set up as my normal, as my lens to see the world, God said, you know what? I'm gonna stretch you out of that. You know, so I, I have so often placed God and myself in a box. And I think we all do to a certain extent and then God has been stretching that box for me, especially in the last four months. Um, so you're like, well, what, what does that even mean? Okay, one way in which God has been teaching me, and so I'm gonna make a confession to you, and I think some of you guys are gonna find yourself in the same boat. You know, I went to Philmont too, so we have a lot of things in common. And uh, one of the things is God is, uh, the way that I viewed prayer, Okay, so right away, you guys bring an image to your mind of what you think prayer is as well. So my image of prayer, I think often growing up, was um, often a list of things that we need and then we ask God for, okay, like this shopping list sort of deal. And while I'm not saying that that's wrong, God has shown me that that is so incomplete. It's just a very incomplete picture of what prayer is. And... Um, I often heard of um, people being prayer warriors. I don't know if anyone here has ever heard of that and talked about intercessory prayer and other things like that. And, and I heard of people that had that passion to pray and I just, I just don't know what that really looks like to be that driven, okay? So that's one, one little backdrop. The second place in which God has been teaching me, so stay with me, because this is important for later, is he's been teaching me about my lack of obedience. Oh, Everybody, anybody cringe when you heard that word? Obedience, <laughs> right? It just, I almost, I, I vision, um, or have this envisionment of this woman at a store and she's at the grocery store and she's got her kids near and she's like, obey mom. And the people passing by and they're looking like, oh, you know, they're having visions of maybe that woman spanks her child or something, or, you know, we just think of, oh, obedience? Like, well, we think of visions of people being brainwashed and not standing up for themselves. This is America, right? We stand up for ourselves. We're independent. We're good. We're training you guys to, to be independent. So when you go to college, you're independent. You can learn for yourself. You can think for yourself. That's all good. So I think our culture... <clears throat> has given us a bad, uh, has given obedience a bad rap. And God was showing me that in my life. He's, he was whispering things about obedience and things I just didn't understand. So those are my two admissions. So four months ago, so that's the backdrop. Four months ago, I read this book. The book is called Miraculous Movements, okay? And God has used this, this book 
use conferences, um, places that I've been to recently, Transnistria, other places, to stretch and grow me. And so what Miraculous Movements is about is right now in Africa, okay, so you guys all can picture Africa, and actually in um, the Middle East and in Indonesia, all right, it's hard to put a number to this, but hundreds of thousands, this, this is what's being reported, what's being given, hundreds of thousands of people are coming to know Jesus, and especially Muslims, hundreds of thousands. I'm reading this, and I'm reading all these stories about people and, and just the miraculous way God's moving now. Not, not, not tons of years ago and, and way back in the you know, 1500s or something. Now, hundreds of thousands. And so I, I just thought, I don't, know, I don't know what that means, or what does that mean for me? It's just, it, okay, so let me give you an example. I'm going to give you a story, okay, about <clears throat> one per, or two people. Okay, to give a picture of how, how is this happening? What does this look like? How are um, thousands of people turning to Jesus? You know, because I, when I think, I, I, you know, one of my first reactions I said um, to my friend was, I, I can hardly remember any time in the last year that someone, say, from the community was brought into my church and, and you know, started following God and, and didn't before, was converted. I, I can't even really remember. And this is thousands and thousands of people and so here's one story. Um, there's a woman named Mama Nadira. And picture, this is a woman that has grown up in a Muslim background. And in a Muslim background, she um, is very strict. She has to follow that. And um, many of you might have heard of this before. One day when she actually happens to meet a man that's a Christian, she becomes a Christian. It's not like it is today, where then maybe she goes to a church and everything's great. No, Mama Nadira is rejected from her family, okay? So that happens in many different places. But, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't really um, dismay her. It doesn't really hurt her vision of what she feels like God has for her life, okay? So Mama Nadira, though, has another issue. She wants to know God's word, but she can't read or write, okay? In her background, women were not given the opportunity to be educated, so Mama Nadira decides she's going to have someone who can read, read her the Bible. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, but that's just not enough for her. She is memorizing the Bible. Okay, she's memorizing whole passages and, and stories because she wants to be able to tell other people. Right, so she's just consuming it. And while she's doing this, she's praying. And whew, I've never heard of such prayer like this. People, what, what is happening in Africa, what is very common, is that they are praying. In the mornings, they'll pray on average one to three hours. Anywhere in there is common, one to three hours. Um, they also meet together. So, like, we get together with friends. They meet together during the week, and they have what's called um, night prayer sessions. Like, um, we kind of think of, like, prayer meetings. But they start at, like, 8 o'clock at night. They take a break at midnight for tea, and then they continue praying till 6 a.m. And it's like, whoa, what does that even look like? What? The? You know, sometimes I, I pray when I'm falling asleep, and I, I'm falling and I'm asleep, and I pray. Oh, no, and I'm praying, and I'm falling and asleep. You know, you know how it is? You pray your night prayers, and then you, you drift off to sleep, and they're praying for hours. And I'm like, Lord, I don't even know what that looks like. But there are people right now, Christians out there that are doing this. And I'm, wow, this is amazing to me. Okay, so Mama Nadir, she's leading this life with fellow believers. And they're bringing people into their home. And they're just being salt and light to other people, telling God's word and, and praying and praying all the time. Lord, they're, and they're praying for America. That's what, I, I met a man who came from, from these areas and is coming to tell people in America what's going on in Africa. And he says, we're praying for you. We're praying for you, America. I was like, whoa. OK. Wow. So there's Mama Nadira. But there's also this man named Zamil. Now, Zamil was a very successful Muslim businessman and made a lot of money. But one day, Jesus got his attention, kind of like I would think of like Saul, how Jesus got Saul's attention. Zamil was asleep. and a man appeared to him in his dream, and he said, I am Isa al-Masa, which in their language is, I am Jesus, the Messiah. 
And he knew who that was because all Muslims knew that you do not go near Christianity. You do not go near Jesus, the Messiah. He's wrong. Jesus appears to him in the dream and says, I am the light of the world. And this is happening to a lot of these people. They're saying, so we're having accounts and accounts and accounts of Jesus appearing to them in, in dreams. And so he says to them, I am the light of the world. And when Zemil wakes up the next morning, two things. The first thing, wow, he is convicted. Jesus has called him. Second thing, and Zemil's still alive, Zemil woke up blind. He could no longer see. So Zemil, he's convicted. He goes to his family and he says, I'm going to follow Jesus the Messiah. And they throw him out. His wife throws him out. They dismiss him, everything, all his business connections, everything. They turn their back on him. They will not talk to him. But he hears about Mama Nadiri. He hears about all these people opening up their homes. He goes to them. He is then mentored and discipled in the word, and he's growing, and he's growing. And they pray for him, and his faith is growing, but he's still blind. So he has this passion to obey God. He, it's kind of crazy because you're blind. How are you going to go and reach out to other people? And he's just recently blind. He feels God telling him, you need to go to this city over here. There's 96% of people here that are Muslim, and they don't know about me. Tell them about me. So he thinks, all right, okay, I'm blind, but I feel like I need to go to this city. He tells Mama Nadira, she says, you're blind, okay? She's, she's praying, but she's like, just gently reminding him, you're blind, Zamil. And other people that have been um, training him in how to go out and how to um, plant churches are like, Zamil, you're blind. You know, how can we send you out, out to the city? And so he just continues to pray, and he feels God. He feels that he needs to obey, so he goes. And, and they're, they're worried because they don't hear about Zemil, and where is he, and what's happening? And uh, they all get together, and they pray, and finally they hear word back from him. He is in the, the other city, and one month later, a church is thriving because of Zemil. And, and Mama Nadira and all of them continue to pray, and Zemil goes to the next place. And he continues to build churches. And to wrap that up, because of Mama Nadira and all the people that she has, um, all the network of people that are praying and praying for God to be moving, moving, spread the word through Muslim Africa. Because of just Mama Nadira and all those networks, 4,000 churches have been planted in five countries in seven years. So, and and that's just the beginning. There's more and more people planning more and more churches and praying and praying. And and so I'm just like, whoa, I'm just blown away. There's another story in the book I I don't have time to share with you, but it's about a a woman who's my age. And and she's going to city, to city, to city, planting and praying. And I'm like, she's my age. And and I'm not that much older than you guys. People that are our age are going out and are doing amazing things right now. So this, it just started to really, really kind of blow my mind how she was praying, how they're both obeying God. And um, so I thought, God, what does that mean for me? Okay, I I don't think it means I'm going to just up myself, go to Africa and join that cause and just leave you guys and... (laughs) that I didn't feel God calling me to anything like that, to stay permanently in Transnistria. You guys know that I've been there three times and I love going there, but I didn't feel God calling me to that, anything like that. Um, so I'm asking God, God, what does this mean? Is this a reality? If you, if you really reign, like we, we sang about, and this stuff's happening and you're allowing it to happen, what does it mean for us? What does that mean for America? Okay, and, and so God... God gave me a couple verses. One verse that he gave me, I felt like, was Hebrews 6.12. Hebrews 6.12 says, Do not become lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So I, I took that to heart. I was like, wow, Lord, I have been lazy. And as I was talking to him, he made it clear to me that it, it was like faith, faith, Imitate your brothers and sisters in Africa. Imitate them. As the verse says, imitate those who through faith and patience inherit 
Okay, I'm an English teacher as well, and inherit is the present tense. They are inheriting right now. Imitate them. Imitate them. So I thought, okay, uh, okay. Uh, I didn't actually go and start wearing clothes like they did and, and running around and, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, living in a hut. No, I, I didn't imitate that way. But God started to teach me about those two things, about prayer and about obedience. So prayer is about our hearts. It's not just this list of things that we go to God with. And, and when we have something else that comes up, okay, you're upset about something that happens, you have a fight with your friend, or somebody gets sick, okay, yeah, we pray to God for that, absolutely. But prayer is about our hearts. It's about getting on our knees every day and recognizing every minute your need for God. Every minute we need God. It's our dependence on God. See, we live in a society where we're so independent, where, you know, you think, well, I can get myself dressed and go to school, and I, oh, okay, and then when I, if something really happens to jolt my reality, okay, I need to read, reach out to God. When in God's reality, you need him every single second. Every second. And prayer is our coming on our knees and saying, Lord, I, I do need you. Prayer is about drawing near to God. It's not just about this list, because sometimes, and I know some of you will be in the same boat with me on this, we know God's in control, right? We know he's sovereign. We learn about that. We talk about that. So why does it matter if I pray? He's going to have his will happen. And we don't say it in a, in a way that's disrespectful, because we just believe in God's sovereignty. But God commanded us to, and it's about drawing near to him. In nearness to God, there's healing. Do you have some Thing that you're hurt about from the past? Are you angry about something? Are you you're just not liking life right now? Maybe some of you just don't have any joy and you hate getting up and coming to school. Or you don't like, you just feel like I don't really have friends. In nearness to God, there's joy. There's healing. There's an abundance of life in nearness to God. Prayer is about getting the distractions away and coming back and being like, yes, Lord, yes. And I cannot begin to tell you, so as I started to ask God, Lord, teach me, teach me to pray. Teach me what that means. God put that joy into me and, and overflowing. I started praying for more people and I, and I started praying and seeing God moving. You know God is always working. Always, always. He is radically transforming all of our world, but we just don't see it because we're living life like this. Okay? But God wants to be a part of our lives. He wants us to see, hey, do you guys know that I'm working in this person's life over here? Do you know that they are going to call out to me and I'm going to miraculously show up in their life? And he's doing that all the time. And because of books and other things, we can see it happening. And if we pick up our eyes, God can show us miracles. He can show us amazing things in your own life and in other people's lives. And, and it, as far as obedience goes, I don't know if you guys, I, I challenge you to look at in Scripture. It is everywhere. God says the blessings of obedience. If you obey, God is going to do so much. God wants to bless you. And, and sometimes when we think of obedience, we just don't want to, right? We have this nice list of verses in Colossians 3 that we have for our school year, and there's a lot of commands in there. Oh, that's really tough. We just don't want to do it. But one thing that God was teaching me, sometimes when I didn't feel like things, and I said, okay, Lord, I don't feel like doing this right now, but what I prayed was, I said, God, I'm going to obey you because you commanded me to, and I just pray that you'll show me fruit, that you'll just bless me because of it somehow. And as I started to obey different things, that it was hard to obey. I cannot tell you the heights that he brought me to through that obedience. And I just wish you guys would have, take, take that little bit of faith, and, and start obeying God. When God puts something on your heart, start obeying it. And see, challenge him. Say, Lord, I'm going to start obeying this. Please show me the fruit. 
please show me, give me the joy that I want, give me all these things. He will, he will. And I just, one, one last thing, a warning. Um, please don't mis- make the mistake. Okay, you're here at Philmont. This is a great place. You get so much knowledge about God. It's so wonderful. We learn about great things about scripture, about sanctification, about justification. But if you have knowledge and you don't have obedience, if those two don't marry, if they don't combine, you are in a dangerous place, my friend. A dangerous place. All of us are. If we have all knowledge and we do nothing with it, if we don't come to God lovingly pursuing him and saying, yes, Lord, I want to obey you, we're going to live our life like this. It's not that maybe we won't be saved. I'm not saying anything about salvation, but we're going to live life a little bit more like this rather than like this. Walking with God and and seeing all that God's doing. Okay, so my encouragement, so my last encouragement is look at Jesus' life. Two things about his life. The first thing is Jesus, before he set out on his ministry, He knew the power and necessity of prayer. He's Jesus. He's perfect. Really? Does he need to pray so much? He thought so. He spent 40 days in the wilderness fasting and praying before his ministry. And then his last words to us, this is really important, so stay with me. I'm almost done. His last words to us. Okay? That's pretty big. He's going to leave us. His last words going out. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So go. And what does he say to do? Last words. Teach them to obey all that I have commanded. Don't just teach the commandments. Teach them to obey, and I'll be with you for always, right? To the very end of the age. What great parting words. He knew about prayer. He knew about obedience. Okay, so, so my urging to you as my brothers and sisters in Christ is, is I want to present a challenge to Philmont, okay? And, and some of you might be more pricked than others and, and might feel the Spirit convicting you, okay? I, I would like us perhaps to see, to talk in the future about how we can move forward as a school, and take a hold of these promises and learn to obey. And what, what that could mean for our lives, what that can mean for all of us. And so if any of you, I would just encourage you in the next week, um, just come and see me and, and let's just start a discussion to see about if God's, if God's stirring in your heart. This, it just, I really feel that um, he wants us to take that little bit, that little step of obedience, okay? If you feel he's stirring in your heart about what could this mean for me. All right, so thank you so much. Let's pray, and then we'll we'll close. Our gracious God, thank you so much that you reign, that you are here, that you always have more for us. You always have more. You're always whispering sweet words and promises to us. I just thank you. I thank you for the school. I thank you for the opportunities we have to even come to a chapel, and I just pray blessing upon these students, dear God. I pray blessing upon their walk with you and upon us as teachers. May we grow in you. May we learn to love you more and obey your commands. Thank you so much, Jesus. Be with us for the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen.